We will have on stage Kevlin Henney. Kevlin Henney is an independent consultant, speaker, writer, and trainer. His development interests are in programming, people, and practice, 3P. So please welcome on stage with a huge applause from Bristol, Kevlin Henney. Hey. Okay. One of the great things about the introduction for me is that it requires punctuation. It requires a comma, it, because otherwise it's programming people. And I'm, I really don't understand people um, the same way, except we're going to talk about people stuff. Now, um, if you were expecting to come and see Marco talk about legacy code, I'm going to have to disappoint you. Uh, Marco is unwell, as already said, uh, so you got me instead. Um, and I want to talk about this idea of agility is not equal to speed. It's not an equivalent idea. <coughs> this is a really important idea. Why? Because almost every use of the term agile that I'm finding seems to relate to the right-hand side. In fact, I did a version of this talk. This is a new version of this talk. I haven't done it since before the pandemic. And when I volunteered the talk yesterday, I said, yeah, of course I'll cover for Marco. And then I went and looked at the slides, and I thought, you know, I have different things to say. You know, I'm going to update all of the slides. But I did, this, I did a version of this talk um, in Amsterdam a couple of years ago, and they got the sign wrong. They had advertised everywhere, agility equals speed. And it's just like, that is almost exactly what I'm not saying. So, there are lots of definitions of agility around. But I'm going to go to the dictionary to find one, because the dictionary tends to have less hype. The dictionary does not sell you certification. Their definition of agility is not bound up with somebody's revenue stream for consultancy. And this is what the concise OED, Oxford English Dictionary, says. Able to move quickly and easily. There are two ideas here. People find two really difficult. What we see is that we end up with quick movement. This is most companies trying to pursue the goal of agility. There's another observation I want to make here. Agile is an adjective. That means it describes a property of something. It's an observable property. It's not a thing that you do. You can do Scrum. You can do Kanban. But you can't do Agile. There are lots of companies doing Agile. I have no idea what that means. Because agility is something you observe. You can say, that team are more Agile than they were six months ago. That team is more Agile than that team. They are able to move quickly and easily. It's also a term you can use to apply to other artifacts like your practices and your code base. That code base is agile because I can move it quickly and easily. Okay? <laughs> and that's the biggest frustration many people have. They get, yep, I'm agile, but my code base has a different vote and a different opinion. Yeah? The whole team says, we're going that way. The code base says, no, you're not. And that's the whole thing. So we need to explore this. But what we've ended up with is this. We've ended up with a culture of busyness. People are exhausted, especially after a couple of years of pandemic. We're even more exhausted than we were before. A lot of the versions of agility that have moved online are very painful. So where does a lot of this come from? We keep getting pushed into this. Our language, we use a lot of this, move fast and break things. This was the mantra that was used by um, Facebook um, I now realize I've talked about Facebook yesterday in my keynote. I'm going to talk about them today. Um, move fast and break things, like democracy. Hey. Um, <laughs> uh, this is not actually Facebook's mantra. This is a 1950s engineering mantra. Move fast and break things. We have this word fast. It's all about speed. Actually, this is what we should be doing in software development. I'm going to encourage you today to move slowly. This whole fast thing, this whole speed thing, is exactly the opposite of what we are trying to achieve. It's the opposite of what was intended 
in the Agile Manifesto. It is the opposite of what is good for people in software development. So let us first of all start with a small word change. We keep using this term fast, and I see it everywhere. I don't criticize it everywhere. I'm not going to pick up on it everywhere. But sometimes when we are being precise, we have to pick on the word fast. There's an obsession with delivering faster. I've actually spoken at two company internal conferences to companies where they've used the term faster in their title of the conference. And there was one I visited, and it's just like, we are, our goal is to deliver better software faster. I get up on stage. The first thing I say is, no, it isn't. I've not been invited back. Um, <laughs> the point here is you're mistaking two ideas. Deliver sooner, not faster. That's, that's not the same. Okay? People love using driving metaphors, so let me give you a driving metaphor. Um, I have a fairly poor sense of direction. So I'm going to say, thank you, Google Maps, because you have saved me from so much pain and loss. And also, a historical note, thank you, TomTom, Tom, for creating satellite navigation that ordinary people can use. My wife bought me a TomTom Tom back in the 2000s. She said, here, happy Christmas. This is to stop you telling me stories of when you got lost in different countries. <laughs> My wife has an excellent sense of direction. She can tell you where all the lampposts on every road are. For me, every road is a surprise. I mean, it's a <laughs> you know, it means that life is filled with possibilities including getting lost. So I always choose certain safe routes and things like that. So when our kids were little, and any of you who've got children, in fact, any of you who've got more than one child will know that you end up being a taxi service. And that sometimes one child needs to be here and another child needs to be there. Oh, they're going to a party, but we need to buy new shoes. So. Your Saturday and other days are filled with all kinds of stuff. And occasionally we would do this and two cars, and we would meet up somewhere for a coffee and a cake or something like that. And then we'd say, okay, right, let's go home. And it would be a case of like, okay, who's going to get home first? I always drove faster. I have the speeding tickets to prove it. I always drove faster, but my wife always arrived home first. She arrived sooner. This is the important point. I would use more velocity, I would use more distance, I would use more fuel, but she got there first. Which one do you want for your software development approach? I really hope you think that my wife's approach is better. Now, I can probably do software development better than my wife, I hope. <laughs> I'm paid to do it, so yeah. But that's a point. This is the goal. It's, most of the time, the words don't matter, but when they matter, they really matter. Our goal is not faster, it's sooner. That's what we're interested in. So let's take out the speed and the busyness and the exhaustiveness. And while we're picking on words, this is one of the words that dominates things. Velocity, originally as a word to describe development, was kind of popularized, it didn't come out of Scrum, it was really popularized out of the XP community. Now the word velocity has a number of different meanings, but given that we are in a technical domain, we should choose the technical meaning and choose to be precise. Teams are not measuring or optimizing their velocity. What we find is they're actually doing something else. Velocity, let's get the physics done. Velocity. What is actually being measured? Okay. Velocity is a vector. There is speed. In casual conversation, we might use the term velocity to mean speed. But we're in a precise context. We are technical people. Therefore, it has a magnitude. It has a speed. And it has a direction. Velocity is speed and direction. You know, I think if teams did measure their velocity, that would be a good thing. But they're not. They're measuring their speed. These two ideas are really different. Okay? I'll give you a simple example. 
How fast are you traveling? I'm traveling at 150 kilometers per hour. Yes, I am on the German Autobahn. That's one of the things I love about Germany. Yeah? It's just like, I am driving at 150 kilometers per hour. Okay. Which direction are you driving, Kevlin? I am driving north. Kevlin, you need to be going south. Yes, but I'm going fast. Look at my speed. Yeah, but your velocity is actually really wrong. You are going in the wrong direction at great speed. I give you software development. That's the problem. We are optimizing the wrong thing. I would be better off walking south than driving 150 kilometers per hour north. Okay? I think we should measure velocity. I think it's a really important idea. And what do we mean by velocity? Well, certainly, direction is a spatial concept, and I think we know what that means in the real world. But let me give you two very simple ideas. It's the right thing in the right way. Are we building the right thing? No, but damn it, it feels good. We are building totally what the customer doesn't need or want or, hmm, okay. Yeah, we've built a new JavaScript framework just because we had a small problem. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe not such a good idea. We're building the wrong thing rapidly. Okay. Are we building it the right way? Absolutely not. We, are, we, we have got so much technical debt that the World Bank is knocking on our door. We are building what the customer wants incredibly badly. They are really going to hate us in future for how slow we deliver their future versions of their product. But right now, it feels good. Okay, so that I'm going to give you as a simple example. You can add other possibilities, but even just simply, are we building the right thing in the right way? That is a good way of establishing direction. So when we start dealing with this idea, let's just focus on speed. Let's focus on this idea for a moment. I'll keep it simple. Speed is displacement over time. If I gave you a classic burn-down chart, the burn-down chart is based on the idea of how much stuff do we have left to do. This doesn't actually make a lot of sense from a product perspective because software development is mostly not about projects. It's about products. A good product will always have a filled backlog. Yeah? In, in other words, product development is, is never having to say you're done. You are always building. The goal is what is sometimes termed an infinite game. The goal of the game is to keep playing the game. A project is a finite game. The goal of the game is to finish the game. Software development is product development. The goal is not to hit your deadline. The goal is to hit that deadline, the deadline after it, the deadline after it, and so on. It's an N plus one problem. If you just make it the next deadline, you will pay for it at N plus one, and N plus two, and N plus three. Product development is philosophically and socially fundamentally different to project development. But in software, we have borrowed in the word project and misused it. You can find it every time you open up an IDE. You can create a project. It's in our vocabulary. I use the word as well. I talk, I, you know, I, it's so ingrained in our, in our vocabulary, but it is ultimately the wrong word. So first of all, a product backlog should never look like this. But why don't we focus on what we have done? Let's focus the other way. Rather than what we have left to do, how much have we done so far? What is the distance that we have traveled? S and T, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I think we know that T is time. Maybe it's days, maybe it's hours, maybe it's weeks. But what is S? That's interesting, because we're measuring something. I mean, time is fairly, fairly well defined. I mean, there's a philosophical question as do we truly understand the nature of time, and physicists are really not sure about this. But that's not the philosophical question I'm trying to ask here. Time is incredibly well understood. But S, what is S? Maybe story points. An abstract, an abstract currency that is subject to the forces of inflation and speculation. It's kind of like a cryptocurrency. Who knows what it means? Is it even real? So we're measuring, what are we measuring? How many story points that we are burning through? How many have we achieved? This was five story points. Okay, let's credit that. There's only one problem. 
A story point is a proxy for time. So what are we measuring? I remember I, when I first pointed this out to a scrum master, oh, 2008, I said, you do realize your diagram, your beautiful chart, is measuring time against time. What is time against time? It's not distance against, distance against time is speed. You're measuring time against time. I said, well, time against time is either utilization. <laughs> How much, you know, it's either utilization or it's our actual versus our estimate. Have we measured the amount of software development we have done? No. We measured how good we are at estimating or how busy we are. This has nothing to do with software development. It's a beautiful graph. It's just not meaningful. Kind of like cryptocurrencies. So maybe S stands for stuff. How much stuff? We have We've done lots of stuff. Sorry, could you give, be more precise about stuff? No, it's just stuff. Well, maybe stuff is thousands of lines of code. I think we can see a problem with that. It's very easy to game this, so it's not that. By the way, this is true of many metrics. We need to be very cautious. There's nothing wrong with lines of code as a metric. Honestly, it is the best, it is the most faithful measure of the number of lines of code you have. If somebody answers with a different unit, that's no good. If I ask the question, how many lines of code do you have? There is only one satisfactory answer. It's not very useful a lot of the time, but it's a good measure of the number of lines of code you have. Maybe it's a measure of value. Now, I have a difficulty with the word value. It's, it's the accepted term. People always say, we, yeah, we've got to generate value. The problem is, what does the word value mean? There's this lovely Tom Toro cartoon from a few years back. Yeah, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. The point is, what do we mean by value? Because Value is an incredibly vague term. When somebody tells me we need to generate value, we need to generate business value, you have not actually answered a question. That you've answered it with a word that doesn't mean anything useful at this point. What do you mean by business value? Do you mean market value? If you do, guess what? You don't control that. You are trying to measure your development in terms of something you can't control. You could have the best developers in the world in the wrong market, developing the right product, but nobody realizes. Are you generating market value? Sadly, no, you're not. But does that mean that you're not making meaningful progress? Yeah? You can, I'm sure we all can all think of good examples of good products that failed and were developed by good teams. So market value, do not measure in terms of something you do not control. Okay, it's a bit like me trying to measure my driving progress in terms of the weather. Oh, if I drive faster, maybe the sun will come out. I must have driven very fast. The point is, don't measure your success in terms of things that are not under your control. Although it has meaning, it's decoupled. Okay, value to the customer. Is that business value? It could be. But notice, it's to the customer. What about our business? It turns out sometimes what is good for the customer is not necessarily what is good for us. Not that it's necessarily bad, but sometimes we might do something for the customer that is of far greater value to them. Oh, actually, I'll give you a really simple example. This goes back many years, and it was, um, my boss was really annoyed with me after this episode. We were doing a whole lot of image processing. It was to do with uh, uh, water systems. And there was this question of, what about all the files, the images that we are taking of the pipes? How should we organize those and search those? And my boss said, I think we should sell the customer a database solution. And we're having this conversation with the customer, so it's really because of, oh, maybe a database solution. Kevin, what about that? And I said, actually, I think we shouldn't do that. I think we should just name the files in a systematic way, according to the date. 
In other words, use an ISO 8601 formatted date in the file name with a location. And now, we're going to use the file system, and we don't have to write any queries. The customer can use any tool they want. They don't have to use our product. The customer was absolutely delighted. Because I said, honestly, that will take me 60 minutes to put the code in to do that. I generated value for the customer. My boss was really annoyed because he was hoping there would be two weeks of database work in there, which would generate value for our business. So when you use the term business value, do you mean your business or somebody else's business, the customer's business or your own? And when you're using this term, do you have a time frame? Because business value over one week is different to one month, over one quarter, one year. Some of the things that have great business value for a, for a, a few months have poor business value over a longer period. So next time, I'm not saying that using the term business value is wrong. I'm just saying it's not an answer until you tell people what you mean by business value. The next time you go to a presentation and somebody says, we need to generate business value, or this maximizes business value, ask them what they mean. If they have an answer, that's great. They know what they're talking about. If they don't, they're just repeating words. Guess what? A lot of people just repeat words. So we can be more precise. And is business value the things that are good for our business that cannot be measured in euros or dollars? If we do this, the team is going to feel stressed. If we do this, everybody goes home on time. I think that option number two is of better value to the business because it cares about the long-termness. The goal of the game is to keep playing the game. You want to keep the people. So business value is not an answer. It's a question. Which makes it even more exciting when we start talking about prioritizing by business value. What the actual does that mean? Well, there is a problem. And I, this is an interesting point. You can't prioritize by business value. I see a lot of texts. I think it might even be in the Scrum Guide, but I certainly see a lot of blog posts and a lot of talks. We should prioritize by business value. I think I probably even said it in the past until one day I paused for a moment and said, wait a minute, we don't know what the business value is. Because where is the business value? Or rather, when is the business value? The business value is in the future. You, are, OK, this is the bad news. You do not know the future. You cannot prioritize by business value because you don't know what the business value of that feature is until you have built it, shipped it, deployed it, and then measured it over whatever interval you said was meaningful for business value. This is the point. I'm not saying, so let's be very clear about what I'm saying here. I'm not saying you shouldn't prioritize by business value. I'm saying you can't because of the laws of physics. If you are able to violate the laws of physics and travel through time, honestly, what the hell are you doing here? Go see the dinosaurs. Go into the future. Check out the stock market. Come back. Place a bet. Find out when Bitcoin goes up or down and make the bet the appropriate way. That is what you should be doing if you can predict the future. But we can't. So the best you can do is prioritize by estimated business value. And if you are ever tempted to say, oh, yeah, but Kevin, it's the same thing, then you and I need to have a really long and deep and meaningful conversation about the difference between actuals and estimates, because they're not the same. And if you heard, <laughs> I think every software developer knows this, but sometimes we need to be reminded of it. Business value is an estimate. Okay? It follows a distribution of some kind. Sometimes it can be very broad, sometimes it can be very narrow. And the problem is you can't easily prioritize by, business value, by estimated business value because it's not totally ordered. If I tell you this, is worth, this could be worth 1 million euros plus or minus half a million, how does that compare with this could be worth 800,000 euros plus or minus 100,000? Which one is higher in priority? The second one is more certain, but the first one potentially offers me greater gains, but it also offers me greater losses. These are not totally ordered. So we need to be a little bit more aware. We need to bring our maths and physics to the table, not just our computer science. The point here is that prediction is very difficult. Especially about the future. Now, what I love about this quote is that I, we don't actually know who said it. 
You see, I've always thought it was Niels Bohr, the Danish quantum physicist. But if you ask the internet, our greatest source of wisdom, it will tell you it might have been Niels Bohr, but it could have been Yogi Berra. It might have been Abraham Lincoln. Who knows? It, Einstein was probably in every quote can be, there's always an Einstein one. The point is, we don't actually know who said this. And that was the past. If we can't predict the past, how are we going to do the future? This is something that happened and we don't know the answer. And you're telling me you can predict the future? Congratulations. So let's talk about roadmaps, because that's another metaphor that I have been jumping on for the last few years. Like velocity, it would be really good if we did it. But we need to understand what it is. Velocity is not speed. It involves direction. I think we should measure that. Roadmaps are a great idea. In fact, if you, it's just that we don't do them right. In fact, if you go to, if you go to Google, as I did last year, to do a talk, I thought, let's go and Google roadmap PowerPoint templates. Oh my goodness, there are loads. And they all normally involve something that looks a bit like this. You can download them, use them in your presentations. They all pretty much look like this. They all have one road. I want you to pause for a moment and think how useful a roadmap with one road is. You see, this is Bristol. This is where I live. This is a road map. It's filled with possibilities and traffic jams and roadworks, which change where you want to go, how you want to go. It's going to be five minutes faster this way today, but it could be five minutes slower that way tomorrow. You drive by, that's the point of a road map. It shows you the possibilities so that you are able to reroute, so that you are able to get this respond to change. Hmm, that sounds familiar. You are responding to change because you do not know the future. You can estimate possibilities, plural. If you have only one idea, I used this quote yesterday in my keynote, there is nothing more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. Emile Auguste Chartier. There is nothing more dangerous than a road map when you have only one road. That's not a road map, that's a prediction of the future. That's an assertion of the future. It's an itinerary, not a road map. You don't need a map for that. So, a brief reminder, and this is one of my favorites, lots of these roadmaps you can find on Google also include examples, you know, this is the beautiful order development process we follow. But the best bit I love is the fact they put years on. This was obviously, this template was obviously created in 2018. How many people had global pandemic for 2020. Global pandemic disrupts all of our work and the work of our customers and all of our supply chains and our understanding of how the world works. No? Okay. Your ability to predict the future is obviously a little bit, you know, imperfect. So there's a point here. The whole point of a roadmap, what you do is you say, you say, here is our roadmap. It shows, don't show too many roads, but three roads is normally enough to give people an idea. Here is our preferred optimal path of development, the most likely given what we currently know. But we could also see that there's a route here and a route there. That's enough to show people the possibilities. As you drive, as you drive your development, as you progress, new information becomes available. But the situation changes and you say, ah, right, so this is now clarified, this road is no longer relevant, our primary choice looks like the most likely candidate, but there is another possibility based on our conversation with marketing recently. You show a different road. That's the point. That's what makes roadmaps exciting and useful. Which tells us something about the nature of development. We don't have to learn, we don't have to go back very far. Well, in fact, we can go back a long way with our time machine, remember? 1968, the NATO Software Engineering Conference. Many people sort of say, oh, software engineering, that's all kind of like big upfront design. It's all plans. It's all iterative design. What? If you actually read that document, there's a lot of stuff about you know what? You can't know everything up front. Maybe we need to make design iterative. So, yeah, there's an observation here. That's actually two days in a row. I've also quoted Neil Gaiman. Um, you have to finish things. That's what you learn from. You are always operating with incomplete knowledge. 
You never know everything that you need to know to do the work that you are doing. Okay? Emily Batch made that point earlier today in her keynote when she talked about the fact you're always at least a sprint behind everything that you need to know. You react to that, and that's fine. Because guess what? One of, one of the superpowers you get for free with being human is the ability to work with incomplete knowledge. You did it this morning when you got up. Okay? You did it yesterday morning when you got up. You don't know everything about what's going to happen. You have some ideas, but you navigate the day. The problem, the challenge, is when we fool ourselves into thinking that we know everything. That's the problem. It's not that we don't know everything. We are always working with incomplete knowledge. And if we acknowledge that, it turns out we're really good at it. But if we fool ourselves into thinking this is knowable, that's where the problems start. That's why we have all of these issues. That's why time is one of the most challenging things. This quote, uh, I've seen it come up, or words to this effect, a number of times recently. There's never enough time to do something right, but there's always enough time to do it over, to redo it. I've seen a number of people quoting this, or words to this effect, and they've attributed Martin Fowler and other people this century. It's actually from Melvin Conway. Again, Melvin Conway got a mention yesterday in my keynote. 1968, Melvin Conway said this, nothing has changed. Whenever we talk about, oh, maybe we design it like this, or you know, we take a slower, testing-based approach, people go, oh, we don't have enough time. We've got to deliver value. Hmm. Yeah, it seems that time is our issue. So, how do we do this? When we talk about, I said before, software development is more like an infinite game than a finite game. It's also a game that is a team sport. It's played collectively with people. Of course, you can develop software individually, and many of us start out like that, but most of what people are doing is collaborative. It is about group intelligence. We can't know everything, but we can certainly explore possibilities and anticipate things. This is the idea of group intelligence. Now, this is a brilliant piece of research that was done uh, 11 years ago, um, or that, that uh, I, I'm going to quote in a moment, but this idea of group intelligence is what we have people for. We don't have a team so they can be more productive. It's not a typing competition. Okay? Software development is not a typing competition. If it were a typing competition, that's a solved problem. We send everybody on a touch typing course. Software development, solved. Okay? Next problem, world peace. Okay? We've solved software development, everybody types faster. But it's not a typing problem. It is a thinking problem. It is a problem of intelligence and knowledge. If you're all thinking the same, you're not thinking. This is important because just getting a bunch of people together does not automatically grant you group intelligence. So this research that was done over a decade ago, there's little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. Yeah, in, in Britain, we call this parliament. But the observation that Anita Woolley and Thomas Malone said, if a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. There are a handful of you that knew this. Collectively, you could be smarter. You know, when I, when I realized this, I actually changed the way I ran workshops. I started making sure that if I had women in the workshop, I would make sure they were spread across the team because I didn't want to give the others a disadvantage. And it made a difference. Why is this the case? Is it just down to that? No, it is about disrupting the defaults. I've done work at companies where they had the same demographic. In other words, it's very common that we recruit in our own image. We recruit people like us, who then recruit more people like us. Hmm. Same age, same background, same nationality, same gender, same... Yeah? There's a point here about this idea of thinking broadly. If we are all thinking the same, we're not really thinking. We're not taking advantage of the fact you don't want to have everybody being identical. This is really important. You, group intelligence is enhanced by having a spread. 
So you will change the way that you communicate without realizing it. Now, let's be very clear. I'm not saying this is perfect. This is statistical. This is social science. It's very messy. But there is an idea here about having seen this play out in a number of companies, negatively generally. Oh, we all, we're all the same people. We all program the same. We all came out of the same university and we're all within about three years age of one another. There can be real issues with that. If we go back, so here we're understanding that one of the key elements of agility is, bizarrely enough, individuals and interactions. Who are they and how do they interact? That's really, the, that's really subtle, it's very difficult, but it's where the action happens. It's what can differentiate a good team from a poor team. I once worked on a team where there was one guy, and I was, somehow, simply his presence made things work. I don't mean that you know, he kind of came up and blessed the computer and the bugs went away. I mean that when he was there, Whenever he was there, the way we interacted, how we got things done, just the, the days and the weeks were smoother. He wasn't a project manager. It's just things smowed, sl flowed more smoothly. I was once asked to write a referral, a, a referee, um, or referee his um, uh, uh, job application to provide a reference for him. And, I, and that was the thing, as I found it difficult because his technical skills were not the best on the team. It was just the fact that he helped make a team a team. It's a very difficult thing. It's very subtle, and yet it made all the difference. So here's this idea. How do we make groups of people smarter? Well, it turns out there's a book published nearly 20 years ago by James Sirovicki, and he had a very simple way of describing this. He said, you want to increase group intelligence rather than decrease the group <laughs> to a low level of groupthink. Four conditions. Diversity of opinion. You don't all think the same. Independence, you are able to think independently, which is very difficult. We are social animals, we naturally influence one another. Decentralization, we draw from different sources of knowledge. But it's no good having all of these, all this forking if you don't then merge. You've got to bring it back. How do you aggregate? The code base is an aggregation mechanism. A meeting is an aggregation mechanism. God, even Slack is an aggregation mechanism. These are all ways of trying to get us back. So having the separation is good, but you've got to put it back together again. So it turns out that people are the magic ingredient. It's not about speed. It's about how we work together. Brandon Schwartz had it as to be a 10x developer, be a good developer who helps 10 other people get better at what they do. It's not about the individual productivity, whatever that might be, unless you are doing this as an individual. But most people aren't. Most people are working on software that is not new and that there are many other people working on that. And that's often a disadvantage because of how we've set it up, but that's where the superpower also lies. But it also gives us something else because it means that sometimes what we produce is not logical. Melvin Conway is most famous for Conway's Law, 1968. This is the wording. People often forget and don't read the paper. The original paper is four pages long. They often misquote it. And he's very clear about this. It's not a law that you follow because you choose to. It's just a natural consequence of how people communicate. The ways that people communicate influence the things that they build. Because of why wouldn't it? I mean, it's kind of obvious when you state it like that. But that's what he said. The basic thesis is that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. And he showed an example. But he also made the point, and his original point was that this is, we can now choose how we design teams. It's not just a consequence for legacy systems, it's a choice that we can make. We have found a criterion for structuring of design organizations. The design effort should be organized around according to the need for communication. I've heard people call this the reverse Conway maneuver. They only call it that because they didn't read the Conway paper. That's what he was proposing back in the, 19, in the late 1960s. And indeed, we understand some people do read this, um, Adam Tornhill, his wonderful book, Your Code is a Crime Scene, he makes this observation. Even though Conway formulated his law around the initial design of a system, the law has important implications for legacy code. Now, this is an important aspect because we need to understand the nature of code. This is from a paper, uh, 2014, a uh, brilliant piece of work by Rob Smallshire. 
looking at what actually happens to the code over time. How much code is written by the current team? Because he looks at how the team changes over time and its impressions on the software architecture. It's not just the software architecture at one moment today. The people you've never met who wrote lines of code originally will influence what you're doing today. I said it yesterday, we're always programming in the past. In fact, one of the interesting things that came out of Rob's work is this. This is half-lives. Lines of code have a half-life of 13 years. Developers working on a particular team have a half-life of three years. Developers change more rapidly than lines of code for large code bases. You know, plutonium is somewhere over there. It has a really long half-life by comparison. Rob simulated the effect of a team having new people and people leave over time. So we can, every time you see a black line, that's somebody leaving, but their impression continues, their influence continues. As Rob said, the state of a system reflects not only the organization, but the organizational history and the flow of people. What I mean is that the structure of the software reflects the organizational structure integrated over time. So, we need to be careful when we talk about people. People kind of come up with new ideas. They say, we need to scale things because they don't understand individuals and interactions. This is a quote from Voltaire. This body which was called and which still calls itself the Holy Roman Empire was in no way holy, nor ho uh, Roman, nor an empire. I think he said this in the late 1700s. Voltaire's observation seems to provide a template for the scaled agile framework. There's no way scaled, nor agile, nor a framework. It does not solve the problem that people have unless the problem is, how do I get a scaled agile framework into my organization to pay consultants? That is the problem it solves. Normally, when you want to scale something, you need to scale down, not up. You need to reduce the interdependencies and communications, not increase them. So, I will leave you with a thought, and we might have time for a couple of questions. But what we're after, it's a lovely book from Austin Cleon, an artist. Many of his books apply very well to any kind of creative work. And what we do in software is incredibly creative. We create something out of nothing, quite literally. He said, it's impossible to pay proper attention to your life if you are hurtling along at lightning speed. When your job is to see things other people don't, you have to slow down enough that you can actually look. It is your job in software development, whether your role is in UX, whether you are a back-end, a front-end, a systems developer, whether you are a product owner, it is your job to see the things that other people don't. You have to slow down. It turns out that agility is not speed, it is the ability to deal with a rate of change. It is not velocity, it is acceleration. Changing direction is acceleration. Speeding up is acceleration. Slowing down is acceleration, but only if you ask a physicist. That's what it is. It's the ability to maneuver in response to new situations. Raw speed is what lean is about. It's about optimizing for a known situation. Agility is not about that. Thank you very much. <laughs>